Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. It certainly is. Sunday evening, Dreamland underway once again. It's going to be a busy one. Lots of good stuff. I'll tell you right now, Linda Moulton Howe has an interview coming up with Jesse Marcel Jr. Here in a few moments. You don't want to miss that. My main guest tonight is going to be Daniel Brinkley. And you definitely don't want to miss that. I'm going to update you on several things. First, I'm going to wel- welcome some uh, new affiliates to the network. KLDI in Laramie, Wyoming. Good to have you on board. 1210 on the AM dial in Laramie. Then there's KDTH in Dubuque, Iowa. 1370 on the dial there. Welcome. And WMIX AM in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Uh, 940 on the dial. Welcome. Good to have you all on board. It's going to be a a very busy night. I do want to uh, begin the program by saying, last week, a most incredible thing occurred to me. And that is, I received a three-page letter from a man who claims that his grandfather was on the retrieval team at Roswell. Accompanying the letter was the most incredible array of what is claimed to be crash debris from Roswell that I've ever seen. I am taking the following steps. Number one, uh, the materials are still available to be viewed by Vidian. If you have the Vidian uh, video program, you can call the number and see the debris. Now, uh, the detail available uh, by this method is, you know, of course, somewhat limited. It's television. So, um, I have taken a series of 35 millimeter photographs. Those are due to be developed and back tomorrow. Uh, As soon as I get those, they should be in quite a bit greater detail, obviously. I'm going to scan them in and get them up on my web page. We are hoping to be able to achieve that by tomorrow night. It'll be tough. We'll see. Um, In addition, uh, these materials are going to be tested. The details of that testing I am not going to make public uh, at this point uh, for a lot of what should be obvious reasons. Uh, This metal is uh, very unusual indeed. Light as a feather, and I won't go into a full description of it right now. I've done that. But it is remarkable, let me tell you that. The other remarkable occurrence at the end of last week was the NBC Dateline show in which astronaut... uh, Uh, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell uh, did a 180 degree turnaround uh, with regard to a couple of items. One will highlight what Linda's going to do, and that is the uh, Roswell incident, which he now declares to be real, and that there is definitely, in his opinion, a cover-up with regard to that. Indeed, he feels the Earth is being visited by others, This is an Apollo 14 astronaut, and he says that also is being covered up, and that he believes the U.S. is utilizing technology gleaned from those people. So all of that is going on, and uh, that's uh, quite a bit of news. We'll get to Linda Moulton Howe in just a moment. Now, to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Linda Howe. Hi, Linda. Oh, he says, there you are. Can you hear me okay now? Just fine. All right. Well, this weekend I was a guest of the Spanish television network Telemundo in Miami. Producer Alberto Leyes is putting together a special which will be broadcast next Friday throughout Latin America and parts of the United States about the Chupacabras mystery. My participation included showing photographs of deer and foxes in England with odd bloodless puncture holes in the middle of their foreheads, similar to some of the rabbits and other unusual animal deaths that have been blamed on the chupacabras in Puerto Rico and in other countries. One of the guests on the show was criminal police detective Rivera Diaz of Carolina, Puerto Rico, who discussed his own sighting the beginning of this year. The new aspect of his report, which is now just emerging, was seeing the feathers or spikes along the unknown creature's back 
move while making a strange rustling sound, and even as strange as this sound, the policeman insists that he saw these feathers or these spines glowing with light. Then Agent Diaz said the creature rose straight up into the air and either flew away or disappeared. He was not certain which. He videotaped uh, with Telemundo a lie detector test, which will be part of the Telemundo special. And if this is true, Art, glowing feathers or spines that can lift a humanoid-like creature is not a description that is found in zoology books. Indeed. And as we all discussed in Miami... What is this chupacabras of Puerto Rico, the chupala of Mexico, and the chupa chupa of Brazil? All names related to something that sucks tissue and fluid from its victims, according to a few eyewitnesses. And tonight I heard from international investigator Antonio Huneas, who just returned from a conference in San Jose, Costa Rica, that double puncture holes have been found in the neck of animals there near the capital. And apparently there will be more reporting about this in a future journal. He said there were dozens of stories about it in the Capitol. And what we're all trying to understand is, is some of it contamination because of the Puerto Rico sort of sometimes sensationalized tabloid reporting, or are we truly getting reports from as many varied countries now as Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, uh, the nation of Mexico, Puerto Rico, and perhaps some areas in the uh, southern part of the United States, and this is a story that is unfolding. It is not over, and I'll keep trying to report, but also in the news are the alleged fragments from UFO crashes, which have come to you and the one that the Roswell UFO Museum has, right. and remember a couple of weeks ago I interviewed the museum secretary treasurer, Max Littell, and two scientists who had examined that copper and silver fragments. Physics professor C.B. Moore was not certain what it is, but hypothesized it might be a piece of microphone diaphragm from a radio transmitter used in the once top-secret high-altitude balloon experiments called Project Mogul that most of us have read about. Well, Max Lattell sent a photograph of this artifact to Dr. Jesse Marcel, Jr., son of the late Jesse Marcel, who worked in Air Force Intelligence and who traveled to the ranch between Corona and Roswell in early July 1947, where the rancher Max Brazel said that he found this material, and there Jesse Marcel Sr. and others gathered fragments of what was called a crashed flying saucer. Jesse Marcel Sr. took several fragments and small, thin, I-beam-like structures home to show his family. His young son, Jesse Jr., had his hands on several of the pieces that his father brought to the house. And today, I talk with Dr. Marcel about how he would compare what he saw with his own eyes to the unidentified artifact delivered to the Roswell Museum. And right. now, uh, Dr. Jesse Marcel, Jr. It resembles a lot of stuff that was there, you know, metal fragments, or that uh, kind of a generic description. I, uh, you know, I can't say yet. absolutely yes that it was part of the wreckage, or absolutely no, it wasn't. It just, you know, I don't recall seeing a copper uh, you know, coloration to it like that, uh, Case apparently has, but but that's uh, either here nor there. It, you know, it certainly could have been another part of the uh, wreckage. But uh, it, you know, uh, you, I can't say yes or no. But it, it does resemble a lot of what I've seen, with the exception of the copper coloring on it. <laughs> now, did you personally handle the debris that night when your dad brought it home? Yes. And did you experience crumpling stuff and it uh, flexing out? No, I did not. No, I, all I did was handle it. I looked at it. I didn't try to tear it or do anything with it except just uh, just handle it and uh, kind of look at it kind of wonder what the stuff is. And the color you remember? It's uh, more like a dull aluminum uh, uh, finish. It, it wasn't really uh, reflective. You know, it's kind of more of a dull uh, aluminum. I guess, you know, if you want to take some aluminum, aluminum wrap, you know, a core wrap, one side is real shiny, the other side is kind of uh, dull. Mm -hmm. It'll be more like the dull side. Okay. And um, when could you describe again, were you looking or handling those pieces that appear to be torn as well as uh, those little tiny eye beams and could you describe them again? Well, you know, again, the, uh, the metal, the uh, foil-like remnant was just exactly that. It looked like pieces of... Uh, 
of a, of a type of metal foil, very thin and uh, very light. I did not try to bend it, stress it like other people at all. I'd heard you know, later that people have, but I did not do that myself. And uh, there's a lot of that little, well, that uh, kind of debris. And then, of course, the, uh, the I-beam, or what I recall is I think, it, you know, that's my memory now that it was an I-beam, but it was a beam that had some writing along the inside surface of it. And it was about how wide, the beam? Well, no, uh, I would say three-eighths of an inch uh, uh, wide, you know, I to mention with, uh, or maybe not quite three-eighths. And, and the color of uh, the symbols was? Oh, they were violet, purple, too. Not coppery? Not coppery, no. Definitely not coppery. And so from your memory of what your dad brought home that night, there was nothing that had a copper and silver mix? Not that I remember. Of course it was under kitchen lights and, you know, just a, a regular incandescent light, but uh, I don't recall any coppery type. In terms of uh, your father or you or anybody having having secretly kept any part of that over all these years with all these pieces emerging, uh, would you uh, be willing to say now if you if you or your father kept any? No, I you know, didn't. De we definitely did not keep it because uh, we kept. You know, when we finished looking at it, we put it back in the boxes and put it back in the car and took off with it. So, but definitely did not keep any pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of remembering any discussion by your father about whether or not he learned of any laboratory results? Uh, he never confided that with me. He did. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we did do uh, shortly before he died, maybe a couple of years, a year or two before he died, was to kind of compare our, our mental no notes on this thing as to what it looked like, uh, the color of uh, writing in the I beam or the beam, whatever, and the description of the metal foil. We compared notes with that. <laughs> and uh, we you know, both recall the same. Since there is now, what appears to be anyway, testimony emerging that would say that there were a number of crash sites in different localities, and even confusion now about whether uh, there was a crash site between Corona and Roswell or a crash site that was. Uh, further toward uh, the Capulet Mountain, do you know if you're, if right now, could you say whether your father ever defined the latitude and longitude where he was? You know, uh, I, he never told me about that. He did say, I think he was involved in only one collection area, and that was one on Brazel's Ranch. So there you have this from doc Dr. Jesse Marcel, Jr., which is one of the few mm. people alive who uh, allegedly had their hands on some kind of crash debris from what was described as a flying saucer in the early part of July 1947. All right, Linda, let me uh, just quickly jump in and ask you a favor. Mm -hmm. When you get the photographs, which through the Internet uh, or otherwise, you will have very soon of the okay. debris that I have. Hopefully you can get that to him as well because yeah. what I've got here sounds more like what he says he saw. All right. Well, this will be very interesting, and uh, depending upon his uh, response, I'll also put that on an upcoming uh, Dreamland. I think we're at a time where art, a couple of things could be happening. Some real debris from something not terrestrial uh, could be in a number of hands, and somebody may also have decided that then uh, the entire uh, market has to be flooded uh, with all kinds of stuff in order to muddy the waters again. And that's what we all have to be doing is separating the wheat from the chaff as best we can. Yes, this could have been sent to me um, for any reason, Linda. You, and I certainly know that. It could be uh, as false as a $3 bill. I know that. Uh, or it could be the real thing. I mean, it's uh, as Max down in New Mexico says, it's either trash or treasure. And we got to keep trying to uh, push with some facts to find out. Uh, and so uh, we will see how this goes, and I will make sure I get the photograph to him on yours. And by the way, if you want information on Linda's uh, materials, we'll tell you how to get that by phone. But she has a section on my webpage now, and you'll see a uh, shiny-faced... Uh, Easy to look at, Linda Howe, standing right in the middle of a uh, a field uh, that has experienced. That, that was. Uh, can you tell us, by the way, yeah. uh, what field was that? It was in England somewhere, yes. wasn't it? 
Yes, and if uh, people misunderstood last week, I meant that I was standing inside of, and I will be sending uh, some photographs so people can see what this magnificent formation looked like from the air also and on the ground. But I'm standing inside what, to me, is the most beautiful formation that I've ever seen at Churhill, which is um, not too far from Avebury that many people have visited or have heard about, one of the uh, oldest and most mysterious cities in that part of Wiltshire. And that particular formation is also where Dr. W.C. Levengood, the biologist in Michigan, found some very interesting effects in the plants and has done a paper uh, about a very odd magnetic glaze that was found on some other wheat, uh, not in exactly that same uh, crop circle, but uh, about a mile or three-quarters of a mile further away at approximately that same time. So something very unusual happened in that Churchill area uh, that summer of 93 when I was there investigating. All right, I'm sure everybody would love to see the entire crop circle, so if you can get that photo to Keith, we'll get it up on your page. I will. All right, um, that web page is my web page, which is www.artbell.com. www.artbell.com on the World Wide Web, and I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and we'll get photographs of the material I have, if possible, up there tomorrow night. Linda, how else do they contact you other than uh, the web? Thanks, Art. Um, one of the best and fastest ways is my toll free 800 number, 707. 707- Nine 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 three, toll free eight hundred seven zero seven nine 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 three, and my mailbox is Post Office Box three hundred in Jamison, Pennsylvania, zip code one eight nine two nine. That's Post Office Box three hundred, Jamison, J A M I S O N, Pennsylvania, zip code one eight nine two nine. And Art, we are, have many mysteries here that we're tracking, and yes. it will be interesting to see how they unfold in the next few weeks. Um, one other thing to mention before we go, we have just about a minute here, and that is the remarkable statements made by uh, astronaut Mitchell yes. on NBC's date line. I presume you're going to try to get hold of uh, Mr. Yes. Mitchell and follow that one up, too. Yes, and I think that that is a real step forward because I know that I have privately talked with other astronauts off the record who have at least this is much this much they have confirmed that there have been odd and unidentified things that they have photographed or seen, but they have not been allowed to be reported and described as such. And maybe this is going to be another part of the beginning of what Dr. Marcel told me tonight. He said, Linda, maybe I'm wrong, but he says I feel like everything is bubbling more and that something right. about this story has finally got to break open for real. All right. Uh, Linda, it's been very productive. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the interview with Jesse Marcel, Jr. Good. Thank you. Uh, by next week, we'll no doubt have more to report. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe, Emmy Award-winning uh, investigative journalist. Thanks, Linda. You're welcome. Take care. See you next week. All right. There you are. Coming up on tonight's Dreamland is Daniel Brinkley. Uh, he's really something. Just back from Lima, Peru, and we're going to catch him about an hour and a half or so off the airplane. I'm Art Bell. This is Dreamland. This is the end of side one. Please leave the cassette exactly where it is. with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222 or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. Certainly is. Best-selling author and world-renowned speaker Daniel Brinkley lives in South Carolina. That's where he does hospice work, carries on the work he was called to do, and researches alternative medical therapies. Brinkley works 
closely with the National Institutes of Health, Board of Compatible and Alternative Medicine to create a better perspective on wellness. Dr. Raymond Moody's most noted student of the near-death experience. Uh, Daniels had two near-death experiences after being struck by lightning and during open-heart surgery, 14 years apart. He is the co-author of the international bestseller, Saved by the Light, and on a regular uh, basis around the national media circuit. He's lectured at numerous colleges and universities, has appeared on such national TV shows as Oprah, Larry King Live, and Unsolved Mysteries. In a moment, Daniel Brinkley. GMX is a magnetic water conditioner, and there are many who have reservations or doubts, and I was one of those people until they put it in my home. There's nothing like seeing to believe. I'm going to give you the same opportunity. Well, all right, here we go to Daniel Brinkley. I know he's back from Lima, Peru. Hi, uh, Daniel. Hi, Art Bell. I don't know where you are, though. Where are you? I'm in Miami. Miami? Yeah, I just came from Machu Picchu. Uh, what in the world were you doing in Peru? Well, since I wrote uh, Save by the Light and then At Peace in the Light, I am always looking to explore to understand from different perspectives some of the things that happen to a person when they have a near-death experience. And since I was uh, struck by lightning, somehow I, in the course of this I came across the fact that there are cultures that have whole scenarios, whole histories of a lightning shaman, persons that are struck by lightning. Hmm. So I was studying the Inca culture and the whole history of the Inca culture was when was a man struck by lightning, and that has determined the shamans or the healers or the leaders or whatever it is that you would title that person. And then I saw Machu Picchu, and the person who built Machu Picchu was struck by lightning, and mm -hmm. lightning determined. And I was thinking of the Crystal Cities, and I started looking at the shamanistic cultures of lightning shamans, and just like Machu Picchu, it would appear to me as I stand down and they just discovered that they were... Uh, that the color of this place, this ruling, was once blue and white plaster. And I could imagine it sitting in the side of the mountain, much like the Crystal Cities I saw in the first near-death experience. So I began to study this stuff. You know, you know, Art, I've, st I've spent 20 years looking at the near-death experience, knowing everyone in the world, and having been going through two of them myself, written two books about it, been a hospice volunteer for 17 years. There's no volunteer for 12 years. I've been with 152 people, well, 151 because the new, my new friend, she's still here. But I've been through 152 people leaving this world and all the various interactions between the family members and the psychologies. And I've learned it pretty well, looking at alternative therapies. You know, and I'm really active in trying to pursue and protect our, our rights because of the visions in the first near-death experience. All right. Now, let me stop you there. And because there is so much new audience out there, Daniel, if you could, uh, give us a description of what happened to you as a basis for where we're going here. Okay. First, I'd like to say that every new person listening to the Art Bell Show has made a smart move. He's a terrific person. <laughs> he covers a broad range of subjects, and he he's very conservative and very straightforward, but he's not afraid to face any issues. Check. I'm Daniel Brinkley. Checks in the mail. Well, it's still true, Art. You're one, of the, you're one of the best. But I'm just a typical everyday guy from South Carolina who, in 1975, spent the early part of his life as a, basically as a complete jerk who had no interest in metaphysics or spiritual things, religion, or any of that kind of business. And then I never would have thought about it To one uh, afternoon in September I was talking on the telephone. And just like anyone would talk on the telephone, I heard a little thunder, and I decided to get off of the phone. And all of a sudden, lightning struck the phone line. It came down the phone line. It hit me in the neck. It went down my spine. It welded nails of the heels of my shoes to the nails in the floor. It throws me in the air, suspends me in the air, and slams me back down. It welded your shoes to the floor. Well, the key was if, if I, had, I had bass weegins on, which in those days, they nailed the heels. Right. And I happened to be just those nails, just happened to be over nails that held the flooring down in the house. Yeah, lightning seeks ground. And it grounded itself, and it welded the shoes, or I would have exploded. It was somewhere around 180,000 volts. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is what happened. 
all of a sudden I'm slammed back down. I never heard of near death experience. I'm burning. I'm on fire. I don't know what to do and which way to go. And I, you know, I never heard of near death experience, and I wouldn't have believed it if someone had told it to me. But then I had it. All of a sudden, I'm in this blue gray place from burning, searing pain, not knowing what to do, which way to go, how to react. You know, just not trying, but trying desperately to get my bearings. Conscious at that point? Oh, I was conscious. You never yeah, to have that much pain, remember that pain, you would have had to have been conscious. Yeah, you never, you know, you, you're always conscious. It doesn't happen. You know, you're always conscious. Then I'm floating. I roll over. I see myself lying across the bed. I uh, I hear my wife telling me that lightning had struck very near the house. The guy on the other end of the phone comes over. To give you an impact of that, I was dead for 28 minutes. No pulse, no respiration, no heartbeat. 28 minutes? Mm -hmm. What it says in admission slip into the hospital, it says patient unconscious, patient not breathing, patient no EKG. And that, I, that's, that's usually called patient dead. Yeah, exactly, but they don't ever say that in hospitals. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's not something that they ever say, even when, they, when you're having, usually when you're having a... Uh, an autopsy, they still don't say it. But, but that's on your hospital record. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no question. It happened in a medical university. I have, like, 176 pages. My med The things that happened to me weren't just, you know, happened in the woods somewhere. I was struck by lightning. I was dead for 28 minutes. I was completely paralyzed for six days. I was partially paralyzed for seven months. It took me two years to learn to walk and feed myself, and I lost more than 60 pounds. And there's medical records of it every day. It's not like... You know, I, I just came up out of the woods one day with this story. Well, did you did you ask any of the uh, medical people? I mean, after 28 minutes, Daniel, uh, there should have been irreversible brain damage at room temperature. Well, you know, it's a lot of true, and, you know, a lot of times people say there's oxygen brain deprivation that causes uh, near-death experiences, and after five minutes you have brain damage. But I never argue that point because, I mean, that could be part of my problem. But the key is that they're resuscitating people now, Art, up to three hours. You know, the old adage of five minutes to the brain is just uh -huh. not true anymore because of ventilators, because of things that you can do, because of where the, where the body is, and, and because we have such advancements in cardiopulmonary resuscitation that the point of death or the moment of death is no longer as stable as the five-minute theorem that was advanced about 15 years ago. People have to remember that the near-death experience, Art, is a byproduct of the advancement of cardiopulmonary resuscitation in, in, the, in the world of medicine. Why people are having this is because they're being, and it's being so widespread, is because of the, the advancement of, of medicine. So, you know, I'm, I, everyone knows that I am pro-medicine in some aspects, and I'm very adverse to medicine in, in other aspects, in dealing with extended life by any means necessary. I'm an advocate of free of living wills and AMAs because... I think it's really important to the fact that I've been struck by lightning. I've been clinically dead. I did the standard system that would occur. I floated above myself. I watched them work on me. Hmm. I watched the amazement that comes in seeing yourself as a spiritual being. I watched them load me in the ambulance. A tunnel forms. I move down this tunnel. I come into the place of the most awesome, bright, brilliant, beautiful light. What is the amazing part about it? Is people always say who've had this experience that they, they're always surrounded by love. The key is that's them feeling themselves again. It's not some external force. It's you feeling you, that, so that love and great comfort and great peace. And why? Because all of a sudden for me, Art, I begin to look at the system. Not so much that I was afraid of anything that was going on because it was safe, but the system of how you come into the light, that you're met by someone that you feel safe with. And a lot of people say they're met by relatives, and you hear this continuously in the process. Daniel, let me ask you a question. Uh, when you began the process of being outside your body and observing your body and then the tunnel and all the rest of it, were you able during that time to sort of consciously think yourself well, gee, look at me. I guess I'm dying. Uh, they're trying to bring me back, but I'm dying. And I wonder where I'm going, and isn't it strange that I'm up here? And in other words, have a kind of a conversation with yourself, that kind of consciousness? Absolutely. Yes? Yes. You're watching it. You're never thinking that you're dead. Were you scared? Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, once it happened, once I lifted out of my body, there was no fear whatsoever. All of a sudden, you it's like returning to the state of consciousness that you began 
the whole nature of the near-death experience is going home. Did you want to come back? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I wouldn't. When I went through this, Art, I went through the. I, I went through what I think is the single most important aspects of the near-death experience, and I write about it in both Saved by the Light and at Peace in the Light, and more in at Peace in the Light. The panoramic life of you. A lot of times, people ask me. They say, Daniel. What gives you such a confidence that there's a life after death and dotted da, out da, da, things like that? And I said, I can tell you the answer to that. I went. When they said I was dead, that's the furthest thing I was. I was alive. And I tranced and moved through whole systems and levels of consciousness. But where is my stability? You will have what's called the panoramic life with you. There was a lot of things I saw on the other side that I had never seen before. I had no ability, no ability to comprehend it, how it worked or what it was. But this part, you will begin to feel after you've been greeted on the other side and you acclimate yourself to it, mm -hmm. you will begin to feel all the childlike emotions that you've had. Then you will form opinions of them, and then all of a sudden you will have a panoramic life review. Was it a... Was it a a solid world, this place where you went, did you see things and people, did they appear to you as they do here, translucently, how, was it the same, can you describe where you were? We are light beings. The place that I was, I had a form, but it's, it's, like, it's like something crushed crystal, like uh, thousands of crystals reflecting and reflect, refracting, just like prisms, and you, your energy and how you, I saw other beings. But how they, how you communicate, and how all that goes on, is in waves of light. You, you are, you are more real over there than you are over here. <laughs> real, more real. This, <laughs> this is the illusion. Uh, there is no question about it in the context of which we are discussing this. Kind of Let me get the panoramic life in art. Yes, please. The panoramic life review is the single most point that all of us can change our lives by. You know, you can hear enough near-death experiences till you want to throw up, or you can listen to it. What good is it uh, to know about it, but how can you apply it to your life? The confidence that I have of what I saw on the other side, if I had never had the visions, which, you know, in Saved by the Light, I wrote, and my history is 20 years of when I met Dr. Moody and I met the early researchers, I told them everything that had happened, and I went to Crystal Cities, the events that I saw that I never knew were the future. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, la the most recent one is the second nuclear accident, which has occurred in Norway, and these things are so documented for, for 20 years that they keep unfolding. That had a certain amount of impact on the credibility of Daniel Brinkley and his near-death experience. But what I think had the most was, I saw my life pass before me. I not only witnessed every single event that from, from if you think that you missed the leaves rustling outside of your window when you lay in a crib at two years old, you're foolish. We record everything. I literally saw every event and everything that happened in my life. And even more important than that, I literally became every person that I had encountered and felt the direct results of my interaction between me and that person. Oh, my God. And I got to feel, because my first 25 years, the biggest jackass, the most belligerent, obnoxious person that you would ever want to meet, you know. And I'm recalling our earlier interview, Daniel, um, and check me if I'm wrong, and I'm going to be really wrong here, but I recall you telling me that in your early life, you've killed. Yeah. Now... Having, uh, you, you know, I, <laughs> I wrote a book, Daniel, and that was, that was painful enough. That was like revisiting my whole life. It was very painful. But right. it, at the level of revisiting your early life that you're talking about, it must have been a terror. Well, it had its moments. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Our, when you look at your life, because I saw I was in the, the Southeast Asian business, I worked for various government agencies. You know, we lived in the world of proxy wars, and we fought clandestine warfare, which is what we do now. And I was just a small little fragment of that, but I operated in S&D search and destroy teams or extraction teams, or I did logistical support for those things, and I started at 19 years old. And I worked in uh, operations under contract, just like there's a lot of Daniel Brinkley's out of there, out in the world. Most of them are crazier than I am, but there's still a lot of them out there. And, I lived in a world where I, I thought I was protecting mom and apple pie and things like that. I now know that I was the part of the biggest deception that we've ever perpetrated on the American people. And 
But I, when you go back and look at it, when you have a panoramic life review, you will become the person. So I got to feel the anguish, frustration, humiliation, pain, and everything that I brought on everybody. But the key is this, Art. Have you, have, uh, Daniel, have you ever heard from your old bosses? I'm sure they've heard what you've had to say. Yeah, well, you know, I never push it to the point where I expose something that, you know, I change things just slightly. Because would, would cause them discomfort. Yeah, absolutely, because mm -hmm. first you take oaths of silence, and second, uh, the government works in very strange and mysterious ways when they want you not to talk. My problem is this. I'm never betraying anything. You know, I, I don't want to live in that world. Mm -hmm. The war I fight now is for the quality of the final days of those people who are leaving this world. The war I fight now is that that no one dies alone in this country, and I've recruited thousands and thousands of hospice volunteers, and I do lectures and seminars on that. And I believe that the war that I'm fighting now, that no one dies alone in this country, and the quality of life so we have families that are able to commit closure, because we're caught up in a situation where everybody's so afraid of death because of institutions, governments, and religions just lying, that you become so frightened that you will do anything in the world to keep that loved one alive one more day, where is that you're doing such an injustice. And as all these years have passed and all the people who've done research on the near-death experience, <clears throat> they never seem to really commit to where it really matters in the quality of life in the final days. Quick, uh, quick answer. Near-death experience, you were there twice. Does a person or a soul or an entity or a light have a choice? about coming back. Can you say, I want to go back, or forget that, leave the body, I'm out of here? A lot of people say they're given a choice. A lot of times I don't like those people. Because if I was given a choice, Art, you would have never got me to come back. <laughs> and if the, those beings of life would have given me any inkling that I was going to ever return, I would have been figuring out a way from the get-go to keep from having to come back. Why do you think you did, Daniel? Well, I think it was because... People ask me all the time, Daniel, why do you think you were chosen to bring about this information and to, to build the centers, the things that I work on, and to deal with the health care issues, which is what they told me? You, you see so much death, Daniel. You said 100 and how many? 51. 151 people you've taken there. And I live there every day. It's, a, it's, it's my life. Isn't it hard? I no. mean, isn't there a human side of it that's hard, even though you know what's on the other side and you're helping them? The hard part is for the family members who have to go on afterwards. Bereavement. It's hard for the people who wish they just had, they just would have had the five more minutes. The, per, the what people forget that it's heaven or the spiritual world that's gaining that person. That we may be losing them, but the spiritual world is gaining Maybe that person. Mm -hmm. And in that simple moment, Art, in the key to where where 80 million Americans are now as baby boomers, losing moms and dads, aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, cancer, right. AIDS, these kinds of things. Sure. We must become aware. We must be able to handle it like in, at Peace in the Light. I dedicated the book to baby boomers. So as we face our own mortality, we must help those who we love and who have loved us face theirs. These are wondrous, mystical moments when a person can sit with someone and they can be there. And as they're there, they begin to discover the magical wonderment of that they are spiritual beings, that yes, the body does biological shutdown and neurological shutdown does occur, but the twinkle in that person's eye and the, the wonderment of the conversations in those final days both grow and you create closure art. We have a responsibility, every one of us that has the, the ability to speak and has a forum and I'm lucky that I have sold millions and millions of books all over the world, and I lecture all the time about the quality of the final day. We have this responsibility because we're in that age group. All right, Daniel, I've got several questions. Hold it right there. Relax. We'll be back to you. We're at the top of the hour. Daniel Brinkley is my guest at Peace and Light, his latest book. And, uh, boy, do I have a lot of questions. I bet you do, too. Stay right there. This is Dreamland. of nine 
We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wild card line at area code 702-727-1295. 727 1295 in the 702 area code. Now, again, here's Art Bell. Those are the numbers. Don't call yet. Hang in there. We'll get to the lines. That thing is always a semi live when it says we continue with your calls. We'll get to calls. I'm Art Bell. This is Dreamland. Daniel Brinkley back again. Daniel? Yes. I, I've got something I want to run by you. Uh, in America right now, there is a great, great controversy about. Um, how we can end our lives and whether we can end them a bit prematurely with the aid of a doctor. And I, I, want, to, um, I want to run this by you, uh, Daniel. My wife said something to me once, and I, I guess every couple talks about death every now and then, the nature of, and all the rest of it. And um, I've always sort of maintained that uh, whose life is it anyway, and if I were in a great deal of pain and I had a terminal disease that I might choose an early out, uh, that I might choose a way out uh, at the last minute to avoid all that pain at the end. And my wife said something to me that I've never forgotten, never forgotten. She said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, You have to go through what you were meant to go through, and if you don't, there are sort of cosmic uh, repercussions. In other words, you've got to suffer and go through that pain. You were meant to go through it. What is your view about this? Well, I have to agree with her. Really? I am not an advocate of euthanasia. I mean, I will not... <coughs> excuse me. I believe that everyone has their own right. Once you leave this world, Art, and you realize that you are not a poor, pitiful little human trying to have a mystical experience, you're a great and powerful spiritual being trying to have a human experience. Mm-hmm. We, we choose to come here and are chosen to come here. And we are to endure a certain period of time, and we are to, here to handle a job. It's like when a, when a soldier retires and takes his uniform off, that's the same as death to me. He's not, he may be dead as a soldier, but he returns to his spiritual life. Now imagine, a person comes here. All this pain that they're going through, people say, well, they always were great people. They never did anything to anybody, but they ate a pound of bacon every morning for breakfast. So where a person finds herself biologically and neurologically has a lot to do with the quality of care of this body which they have occupied during this earth life experience. Mm -hmm. Now, who's responsible for that? What what I believe, without any question, and like I keep repeating, but I don't, I'm not really trying to say by Daniel Brackett books, but I am. What I keep repeating in my in that piece in the light is how and how you should look at the body, how you should look at your perspective on it, and then to make the decision. If when you realize it, how powerful a spiritual being you are, what a hero it was that you even chose to come here, and only the champions come. Every one of us is a hero. When you come then that decision truly belongs to you. Because I'm not going to tell anybody what to do because I'm just not. But I will stay as long as I'm supposed to. I don't believe in artificial ways of keeping people alive. I believe the natural process will take its course and that that's what we should do. But I'm not going to say you can't. And yet, not... and yet, though, your own experience, artificially, in effect, kept alive, or brought back anyway. Brought back. Uh, surely without that intervention, you would not have come back, right? Yeah, don't you hate it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I it depends on how you look at it. I mean, you may that may be part of the great thread of time and happenings that you, you, you've got to live out. Well, I mean, I'm here doing that, and I realize it as, common, as commonly as my own uh, breath that I breathe. It is the value of breath that is the most important. People have to understand that why you be- how you breathe. What is the value of breath, and why are you to hold on to that last breath? And we've been, religions, governments, and institutions have us going to thinking that we're holding on to this last breath so we don't all go to hell. You know, I come from the deep south, and everybody's going to hell where I come from because of fundamentalism and that kind of uh, thought pattern. But what you have to realize is 50% of the breath you breathe is for you. The other 50% is for spirit. When you breathe air into your nostrils, you breathe it in, it fills your lungs, but it also fills your sinus cavities. As it does that, it activates the brain. The brain activates and attaches itself to the mind, 
the mind activates to the universal consciousness, and then spirit sprinkles little, you know, when you go to get yogurt, you get those little candy things, those little different flavored things <laughs> yes. on the top of it. Yes. And that spirit adds its magic, and then you breathe back into the world. So the way that spirit enters this world is through the breathing process, and each breath, they estimate you breathe about 500 million breaths in a lifetime. Why suicide became such a condemnational psychology was because every breath and literally the universe has to readjust itself when a person takes that breath away from themselves before that chosen time so the answer is don't do it well the answer is is that i wholeheartedly disagree with people doing it but i am not the person to tell anyone that they should now i'll give you a, a study by dr bruce grayson who uh, was at the university of Stor stora in connecticut and he was the psychiatrist on on the work duty during the night. And people who would come in would attempt suicide. People who who had attempted suicide, who had this is like 460 people are, yes. who had attempted suicide. Of those who had no near death experience or any form of it, went on to attempt it three more times or until they succeeded. Huh. They, those people who had some form of the near death experience, not a single one of them ever did. Do Once we? you touch the other side, uh -huh. or it touches you, you find that you are a hero, that this is your job, that you've come and chosen to live in this particular time, in this particular event, and you are to do the best you can to maintain this system that you have called the body and to get your job done. All right, Daniel, a uh, question. Of those that um, clinically die and come back, what percentage, roughly, do you think has a near-death experience? Well... I would, well, they estimate that some uh, of some 13 million Americans have had some form. I would say that it was really roughly maybe 8 to 10 million, and I think 40% of the people who are resuscitated have some form of the near-death experience. 40%. Um, any idea why? In other words, why is there a difference? Why is it not universal? That's a good question. Why, why do some go and not experience that, uh, just uh, blackness or no remembrance of any sort, or how come? Well, remember, we are quite uniquely individually spiritual beings, and there are many mitigating circumstances. Like me, I was struck by lightning the first time, so there wasn't a chance that I was going to have too much uh, anesthesia, that I was going to have a reaction to it, or that I was in a situation to where it could be controlled by how much morphine I was under or what huh. age or what, how the neurochemical reactions in the brain were. And then maybe a lot of times our people block it out because if they knew, uh, if they chose to remember the experience, then it would keep them from finishing the job or the mission that they come to this earth to do. I, mean, I think that we're all very, everyone tries to find a blanket answer because that's the nature of scientists, the scientific approach. When you enter spirituality and you look at it from that point, then you see that there are so many different deviations because of how, how each of us are unique. All right, let's try this question. Um, I, I would think a very interesting study, Daniel, would be... Uh, people who, while they were here, were very spiritual people um, versus those who were not, and then, and then compare the percentages of those two groups that reported near-death uh, experiences. Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, there's been over like nine of those studies done in ten countries. Oh. The, the near-death experience it has a universal, uh, it has universal anomalies things that are continuously, regardless if you were a Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, if you were atheist, communist. Or, I, mean, I've been to, I mean, I've been in ten countries and talked to a thousand people because I had to figure the thing out, Art. I had to know what it was. Okay, is there a correlation between uh, earthly spirituality and um, experiencing and recalling a near-death experience? We all leave the world the same way. There's no... Uh, There's, we, there is or is not a connection. There's not a connection except that you have a greater insight a lot of times. People who uh, follow the spiritual path have in their lives crossed information that comes about in the near-death experience. I never did. I mean, I've never heard anything like this, and I made fun of it. And You know, I was a really cynical jerk, so when it happened to me, I, I had no resources to draw from. I had no conscious way. The second time it happened to me during open-heart surgery... I had like two days to get ready for it. 
And so I looked at every possible aspect. Maybe I would have one. Maybe I wouldn't. You know, I, who knows what those were. Did you want one? Well, I I didn't I didn't want to make it through it. See, what I kept hoping, I refused to have the surgery. You know, I lay there three or four days dying until it got down to the last hours, and they found that Raymond Moody, and he came to see me. And we, Raymond and I have been friends a really, really long time. And I can remember looking up into Raymond's face as he watched me laugh and blood run out of my nose and my mouth because of the damage to my heart and the, the aortic valve was so damaged. And I can remember a face that he made that I never did understand until I asked him later. And he says, you know, he says, listen, Daniel, We've been friends for 15 years, and I've heard people talk about the near-death experience over and over and over again, and that all of them say they're not afraid of dying. He said, being so close to you and knowing you and watching you laughing and refusing to sign the papers and that you were dying because I'm a doctor and I'm in there, I'm talking to your, your doctors. He said, I saw a place of a person who was no longer afraid. So I refused. It was Raymond who came. I was leaving this world. I talked to my parents, my my dad, my brother, my sister, and the people that I really loved. I told them I would. I told my father how I wanted everything to be divided up, and that there was nothing on this earth that was going to keep me here. I am out of this place. Hmm. I'm out of here. And so you wanted to go? Absolutely. You know, people don't understand. This is a job. We come and we do it. Our responsibility now is to help change the world. Remember that in Saved by the Light which I detailed the, the prophecy of the future, just where the banking, this commercial that you, the two commercials that you just did, mm-hmm. it's a wonderment about you, Art Bell. Mm-hmm. You have some of the best commercials because do you realize that the United States government has a bill before Congress that literally, it's called the Kessenbaum kennedy Bill. Yes. It has a clause in it that states it that it would make it a criminal act for a physician or his patient to practice alternative medicines of anything not approved by the medical establishment. I've heard that. And uh, they're voting on it, and everyone should write their congressman. I believe it's seven years possibly in prison, isn't that the penalty? That's exactly what it is. Right. And we have to alert people to that because I believe, Art, that without us establishing our freedom in our own medical treatment and what we go after... We were losing a battle that is one of the serious, most important qual- battles, battles for the quality of human uh, human dignity that will ever come about. And do you know also that one of my predictions that that came about that I had was where America would be? Yes, really, that, that is what I want to ask you about. Uh, watch you, this 2002 thing that they were seeing in your commercial. Uh, oh, yes, uh, but, but I would like to ask you specifically yeah. what, what you saw. What well, you saw in terms of uh, uh, prophecy, what what could be, not necessarily what will be. Oh, absolutely, not necessarily what will be. But because at the end of going through, thir- you know, I went through the Christ- I went through the near death experience, panoramic life review. I went to a place I call Crystal Cities or Cities of Knowledge. I was met by thirteen beings of light. Each of these beings sent messages at me, and I would all of a sudden be living in it. You know, and a lot of people who know me, I predicted Chernobyl. I mean, uh, in, 19, in 1975 and 76, I wrote down this 117 things, all the, from Chernobyl to Desert Storm. All right, well, let's deal with Chernobyl, just as a... How did you see that? In what manner did I saw that... An, I saw an explosion, and then I saw people dying. And I knew it was a nuclear facility because I had seen the Three Mile Island deal with the stacks that the cooling towers right and i saw radiation and I, I was seeing mutations and i was seeing children dying and i was seeing abandoned places in this big explosion and i knew it was called wormwood now i didn't know that back then because i didn't speak russian or ukrainian that wormwood which is a bittersweet herb that's used for digestion and tonics or natural remedies mm-hmm. that the ukrainian word for wormwood is chernobyl and I just wrote all this down. I said the Soviet Union would collapse in 1989 as part of it. I said that America would go to war in the early parts of 1990, and it would be in the Middle East, and it would be called Storm something. I mean, and I said that by 1995, America would be in a place in economic collapse because of literally a conspiracy. Daniel, uh, how did you, uh, this manner of recording, you wrote these things down, um, and how do we know... In other words, did somebody else 
see them? Did you put them in print? Did you publish them? All of this done? Oh, no, I, this, this went on in the early days, Art. I met with Dr. Raymond Moody. These were conversations that he recorded on tape. Oh, that we, good. Good. That, yes, that's I mean, important. So there are cassette tapes that exist of this conversation from 1975. Okay, good. And not only that, see, not only that, in the early days, Art, when people, when these psychiatrists and doctors, I've been around since the first day, since Raymond's first book. I've been around Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Raymond Moody, Bruce Grayson, Michael Sabon, Ken Ring, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, Melvin Morris, I, all the great, all the most noted researchers in the world, George Ritchie, who I think is one of the, the, the people who's really made it possible for people to, he was a psychiatrist and a doctor who, was a, who taught at the University of Virginia, who first got inter Raymond interested in near-death experiences, has written two really good books about it. And having conversations with these people, Plus, when things would start happening, because Raymond Moody and I have been such good friends for so long, he would tell them. I didn't tell people. All right, with such a good track record, Daniel, the, the obvious question to ask is about the as-yet unfulfilled prophecies. In other words, what's yet to come? We live to 2000. In the event. I saw from, I went to the year 2004. But remember what it's predicated on, Art, that between the year 2004 and 2014, and somewhere between 2011 and 2012, the, the nature of how we exist and expe experience ourselves as physical beings will become highly spiritually evolved. Mm. There is almost like, you know, they say the dawn of the Aquarian Age, the end of the Mayan calendar, the Hopis. Yes. Uh, okay, all that stuff uh, points toward an event. Right now, our consciousness is, ex is accelerating. We are becoming far more intuitive, and, and our perspectives are changing right now. Yes. And so if this is speeding up and this is happening, why? Because there is an energy form that is coming toward the Earth again that hasn't been around in a while. So between now and 2004, it's really the shakeout period. We will either take hold and recapture our lives and recapture our own selves and recapture our own health care and recapture this government and, are, and prepare to try to negotiate the end of wars so that this golden age comes or we will be at war. One of the key factors that I, people talk, you know, they see the things that have come true and just recently. I said 1990, 90, in 1986 would be a nuclear explosion and then in 1995 there would be another nuclear accident. All this is written down and there's a thousand people who knew. You know, I've been here 20 years. I didn't just walk up and make this stuff up. I have a 20-year history in newspaper articles and events and the early researchers. And when I didn't start out to be a prophet, I believe that I saw these events so that I would have nowhere to run, that I would have to stay, I would have to work on the centers, and at a certain point in time, I would have to be positioned and position myself to protect the rights of those people leaving this world. All right, Daniel, hold it right there. Oh, You're we've not going to run me off, are you? Uh, no, no, we'll be right back. This is Dreamland. Kingdom of Nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. Good evening from the high desert. My guest, Daniel Brinkley, he'll be right back. This is the end of side one. Please leave the cassette. Right back now to Daniel Brinkley. And Daniel, I think we talked about this last time, but I've been doing this talk show now for about uh, about a dozen years. Just this, uh, this one. It's become larger and larger nationally. But Daniel, I have felt what I call, for lack of any better word, a quickening. And uh, I think that goes right along with what you were saying. I've noticed that events in every arena, economic, social, geophysical, um, Every arena, things are quickening, happening faster, becoming rapidly, um, I don't know if more dangerous is the right word, 
Uh, um, yeah, moving, in other words, it's moving towards something. It's expanding itself, and then we're like getting microcosms. It's expanding. Yes. <clears throat> and I have I listen to the advertisers, the people that you you have as your advertisers. It's so easy and obvious that you are aware of the transition, and you're trying to get the word out. Much of the predictions will be between ninety four and ninety six. In ni- nineteen seventy five and seventy six, I said ninety four and ninety six would be the most critical years. Mm-hmm. And you know, I didn't really understand art so long ago what all this was. I'm a guy from South Carolina. I, I mean, and I never voted it myself into this. I never, you know, this was not my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm there. But we're going to speed up, and it's going to get even more rapid. Look at the world situation. Look at what's happening. I mean, I come. I've been out of touch for um, like 15 days. I come back and I look at the the information about where the Middle East is and what would be happening and Arafat and Jordan and the Palestinians and all those are in my book. I mean, all these things I've talked about and and I said that this is what I saw. I think it's really important to realize that we are are able to control it. You know, there and I'd like to. I'm probably going to. I'd like to say this. I took an. I don't know. I have copies of my book. I just I bought a bunch of copies of my book, the hardbacks, and I wanted to be able to offer them to people who didn't have the predictions and who wanted to really look at it and see it. So if they call me or write me, then I'd send them autographed copy and I'd give it at the best price that I could. Wow. So could I give my address? Oh yes. Uh, can they respond only by address or is there well, a phone it, number? Well, it keeps it. It it's in a place where. I can handle it myself. I'm just that one guy, Art. You know me well. <laughs> I try to get that word out the best I know how and the best way I see it. So as these things are speeding up, as I see the dissolving of Jordan, as I see the next major crisis that we're about to enter war if we're not really careful in Bosnia, the religious factions are warring over the Balkans, the churches, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church are arguing over who has uh, control over the churches in the Balkans. Mm-hmm. We've entered a place, one of the major predictions that I said years and years and years ago was that there would come a time when Jerusalem would become although like a, like a papacy. It would be like the Vatican, and it would be ruled by an Islamic, a Christian, and Jewish groups. Mm-hmm. And the Palestinian-Israeli Accord was negotiated in Rome. The Eastern Orthodox Church owns most of the land mass in Jerusalem. And now this final issue of the Palestinian Accord is how to settle East Jerusalem and Jerusalem as a factor. And that's what Hamas is fighting about. Here was one of the really funny ones I said 20 years ago, that the Arab and the Israeli uh, people, the, Al- the Israelis and the Palestinians would join forces almost like a uh, police unit to regulate and control the radical and terrorist action committees between the two country, between the two groups. And so it is happening. Everybody said, I even described what kind of uniforms they would wear. What? I, I wrote this down 20 years ago, that this is kind of uniforms, and in 94 to 96, everything is being determined. The election of a president, new president in Russia, and yes. I said that America and Russia would be friends for a short period of time, and then it would begin. All right, but, you know, Daniel, that the... Uh, the candidate leading a big lead right now in Russia is a communist. No, see, and it, it was gonna, it's not, it's gonna shift back. I honestly believe that everything that we've been hearing about the Russians uh, was only to gain Western technology and to delude the United States. I mean, I, I, everything that I saw in the future predictions, I think that they're far stronger, far more powerful than we've ever let know. And when you look at the, the information from those last uh, years of Gorbachev that 2,000 tons of gold was shipped to America and now Gorbachev has a $100 million think tank and that I, uh, I talk about Gorbachev in the predictions and who I think he is and how I think he's per- evolved and now he just recently found an environmental group called Green Cross I know. that supersedes all kinds of laws and and I, I, when I look at all that stuff and I see it come into pass exactly like the vision was shown to me, then I see that we are not doing enough to change it. Yep. That's, well, that's where I was going. Uh, without change, major change, it's not going to be very long, is it? Oh, well, it's on top of us. Yeah. If we don't grab a hold to our economy, when we were laughing, the, the year 2002, what, what does the year 2002 mean in balance in the budget? At based at the growth rate of our deficit, 
without taking into consideration for other inflation. I know. In the year 2002, every penny collected by the Internal Revenue Service in taxes, every penny... Goes to service the debt. It won't even service the debt. Yeah, I know. Crunch points before that. It's, yeah, it won't even be. service the debt. Yeah. The other thing is oil prices. This is all in the predictions of Saved by the Light and reviewed in that piece in the light. All the, the uh, gasoline is at its highest. It's at its highest price in five years. But not only that, with the trouble that's in the Middle East, and the fact and I wrote all the stuff down twenty years ago is what's so really funny, and it still amazes me. Or you understand? <laughs> yes, of course. I, I didn't turn out to be Nostradamus or Edgar Casey. I keep seeing the stuff come true, and I do everything in my power by you allow me to be on the show and to talk about it to get people to wake up. Hey, guys. This is not, I'm not some guy from India. I'm from South Carolina. <laughs> this has happened to me. And if I wasn't out here helping my brothers and sisters and the people in the age group, because this is our world. It's not the world of our mothers and our fathers. And we are responsible for the quality of care of our mothers and fathers. We must be active. We must be aware. And we must act now, because if we don't, the repercussions of it will be some of the most horrendous times in history or a golden age. And... I really appreciate the fact that Art Bell exists. If it goes the wrong way, Daniel, what are we facing? Geophysical changes, the, uh, earthquakes, people want to know, I've got a guy here in San Francisco, what's coming, he wants Well, to geophysically, and uh, that's going to happen anyway. And I don't, I don't try to get people to understand that I'm not uh, like every other earthquake prophesier. Well, I'm, that, that's the question. In other words, did you see... Oh, yeah. Let, let's forget earthquakes. Did you see earth... Changes. Oh, tremendous earth changes. Okay. And, it's, and when, pe when I hear people are, tell me that they're being punished and why is God doing this to us and the earth changes, do you realize that this is one little small planet in a solar system? And in that solar system, the Hubble telescope has just discovered another universe right next to this one, mm -hmm. and then a universe slightly to the uh, north of this one. Each one of them contains roughly 4 billion planets and 150,000 stars. What the Earth is doing is it is in its growth cycle, like we in our, in our physical spiritual cycles. What it's doing is it's working in conjunction with 8 billion other planets to keep alignment, to keep evolving the way the universe is set forth for us to spiritually do, to evolve. The American native uh, has had a long-held belief that Earth is almost a living entity. Um, oh, it is. Now, that's panatology. You know, the next thing, a bunch of fundamentalists will call you up and threaten you, but please give them my address when they do call you. Oh, oh, we better get back to that. Uh, Daniel, if they want an autograph, that's quite a, that, that's a real, uh, I autograph books. I know how tough it is. That's quite an offer. Uh, I have a chance to take the heart back and offer it at, like it, if you send me $13.50, I'll pay the postage, and I'll sign whoever you want me to sign to it and have a hardback copy, which they don't exist anymore. I got all the rest of them there were, and it was my way of trying to cut the price and give people a personal way to have the book and in a simple way, just as one guy. And it my name's Damien Brinkley, and it's Post Office Box 1919, Aiken, A-I-K-E-N, South Carolina. Uh, spell it again, please. Aiken, A-I-K-E-N, okay. South Carolina. Right. 29802. And if you just send me a check or, uh, you know, like a cashier's check and tell me what you want me to say in it and I will write it. And it's it's a hardback copy and it's, ch it's cheaper than you can buy it at the store and it's personally signed by me. Four. And what I'm trying to accomplish is that people have a reference place to build a reference library for the period and the times that come. And it was, I, I spent my money. I said, look, I want these books so that I can offer them to people from me and send my heart my love along with the thing and they can keep up with it as it unfolds where are you going to be busy Daniel Brinkley post office box 1919 Aiken A-I-K-E-N South Carolina zip code 29802 right $13.50 and right. regular cost 20 bucks and I'll sign it and send it back to you for as long as you know that as I have them and I'm trying to figure out a way to do the same thing with that piece but I'm having to negotiate that. And I'm trying on my own to give to everybody at a, in, in our own way 
a place to draw their reference from. Like at Peace in the Light, it's you know it's out there still. And uh, and what I want people to do is this is how to deal with the issues of mom and dad and loss and how in 150 experiences to create closure. I think are one of the most horrendous things that happen is we have not set up a methodology by which people can develop closure by using a near death experience as a way to look at life. All the things that's happened to me in these near-death experiences, both of them, has only brought me closer to understanding that we are powerful spiritual beings. We're heroes. We're not subject as little waves cast upon the land. We have a certain job and a mission because there is a great event about to take place. It will either be the most perfect, wonderful change, or it will be the biggest mess we've ever been in, but it will be self-wrought. And mine is to say, hey, guys, I'm not from India. I didn't, you know, I may talk like Deepak Chopra because I always <laughs> laugh at Deepak and tell him he talks funny, but when he listens to this Southern American yeah. accent, he says, I really don't have any place to talk to him. But Dan, you, as you look down the thread of what might happen, either a wonderful event or a horrible event, uh, is there something, is there something, should the horrible event occur, is there something on the other side of that, do you know? Oh, yeah. Or In other be, words, do it we... It doesn't really matter what we do. Do we, By 2012, do we, that event will be here. Do we rise like a phoenix? Oh yes, yeah. We are the we're the we're the champions. We're the we're the great. We must. We are the great champions, and we will succeed. From 1975 to 1989, or 19, when I turned 40 years old, I had lost faith. I couldn't believe that as the predictions started coming true, and I didn't know it was the future art. I just started, saw so it started happening, and it kept happening, and I kept working on the centers, and I started doing hospice work, which I honestly and sincerely believe that the greatest endeavor that any of us can do is to do hospice work. What but do you tell people? When you, when you go to a person who's dying, who's scared, who's uh, holding on to their last breath, fighting for life, what do you tell these people? They know they're dying. What do you tell them? You'd be amazed at how many people really want to talk about it. You know, we, you know, people who are leaving this world know that they are. Uh, the National Hospice Association teaches techniques. Then there's a group that's uh, called the Project Nightlights, which is out of California, that really helps people deal with those issues. I sit with the person, and I, mostly I listen, and I want to hear their life story. So they begin to have the panoramic life review. And as they begin for, to have on this side what's going to happen on the other side, and to help them bring a certain level of peace into that. If a person wants to talk to me, you know, everyone's individual. But I teach a five-hour workshop that teach nothing but, nothing but the technique to enable people to be there in those moments. Mm -hmm. I think that it's so important that we learn that by being with people as they leave this world, we grow spiritual. It is the greatest opportunity for spiritual growth that there is. And I, I try to eliminate the fear of it. And to be able to have closure in family relationships, that's what that piece is about, to have closure in these relationships and to grow in, intuitively and spiritual within the context of the events that's unfolding in this world. Because we are here because we chose to be here. We are the champions and we will not fail. We will succeed but we must take a, a hold on it. Uh, here's one of the two important things that will occur. We're about to have a massive paradigm shift. Our whole structure, our whole basis of our cultural civilization, what happens if they really do discover there's UFOs? What happens to re religion? What happens if... As these things that keep on unfolding and events that other people like me have had, I'm not the only one. I just happen art to have known every single person. And I, w I met Raymond because he went to the Medical College of Georgia. I met Dr. Ritchie and all the people who were researching it. And I've had the pleasure of being around them. But what happens? Like, there's one other thing I'd like to, to bring up. And uh, Daniel, let me stop you there. You tell me, what happens if we discover... Uh, that there is life from elsewhere. Uh, suppose we discovered that that life uh, actually seeded our life, uh, that it challenges the present religious paradigm altogether. Boy, it's going to do it. Yeah, all right. So what happens, Daniel? Won't it be fun? <laughs> Won't it be fun? Can't you wait till you turn on the Reverend Ainsley? There was, Daniel, there was something called the Brookings Report. You know about that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, the Brookings Report suggested that 
uh, it would be horrible that uh, if... Uh, the religion would cr collapse. Yes, Governments it, would collapse. That's right. Institutions would collapse. That's right. Well, I think that's a thrilling idea, Art. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of, of the lion dogs myself. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm so excited because what happens if the government collapses, Art? You know what you'll do? You'll go next door. Well, maybe not you, Art, because you hide out in the desert. Yes, I do. But you would go next door to see what your friend's doing and what your neighbor's doing, and then you would create a true economy instead of a piece of green paper with a dead man's picture on it, mm -hmm. and we'd help each other again, and we would begin to build a true way. I mean, when you hear economic collapse, okay, so what? Big deal. We, we are collapsed. We are at bankruptcy. Yeah. It's just a big lie. I mean, and that's what it is. I just don't think the neighbor helping neighbor part would come until after the uh, neighbor killing neighbor part. Well, I believe that if the government is doing what it's doing, with Medicaid and Medicare, HMOs, controlled, cutting off welfare, all that kind of stuff, they're going to create roving bands of people and outcasts. Yes. And they've planned this. This is I'm not saying that the government's evil, but I see FEMA, I see the how... When you let me slow down, Art, because I'm getting having too much fun. But, well, come on, you know. <laughs> no, I, I can. You know, for one thing, I would like to note that your last interview, and it was a great one, uh, is very was very different than this one. And uh, there's something about where you've been. Maybe your trip to Lima. I know you're just back by hours, but yeah, something something happened to you down there. I mean, here you are off an airplane by just a few hours from and Peru. Been Fifteen thousand feet in the Andes Mountains for fifteen. Yeah, it's like you're still at 15,000 feet, Daniel. Oh, you think I, I mean, you're, you're, down? No, 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 no. I'm just noting it. And, and maybe I ought to just ask you, um, you must have been spiritually renewed or... That's exactly what happens, Art. Yeah. I go there, and I take a group of people, and it's the moments where I get outside the United States. I travel with Visions, travel with Abbas and Mustafa Nadim, and they're the best tour there is because how they handle it, and they allow me to take 25 or 30 people, and well, it's 40 people, and I sit with those people, and we take in the most mystical place in the, in the Americas. We do um, volunteer work in nursing, in nursing homes and orphanages as a part of the tour, and we sit and we go through a program that I've developed based on near-death experiences. I take people through a near-death experience in the high Andes mountains with all of that, and it really affects me. One, one quick question. Have you been to a place called Cusco, Peru? Absolutely. Is it a very spiritual place? It's the center of the universe. You can't even imagine. There are so, there, you can't walk on that ground and not know it. I recommend that everyone goes there. I mean, I, I, there's places in this world that where I see... In, like, by following the predictions. Daniel, hold tight. Hold tight right there. I'm going to go ahead and run this as bumper. This is a group called Cusco. And this was inspired by a trip to Cusco, Peru. You're listening to Dreamland. I'm Art Bell. We'll be right back.
Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Here again I am from the high desert to the world via the internet and this uh, whole great country way beyond. It's good to be here. I, um, I guess I'm going to repeat something I said earlier uh, and it really falls right in with what Danian has been saying regarding change on the way. Oh, there's change on the way, all right. All right, back now to my guest, Danian Brinkley. And uh, during the news, I left some of Cusco uh, on. I just sort of let it go through the news. You didn't hear it, but Danian did hear it. It was terrific. And let me tell you a little story, just real quickly, and maybe you can react to it. Uh, about throw two or three years ago now, uh, Danian, I heard this music. Uh, which is written by a fellow named Michael Holm, who lives in Bavaria, and it was inspired by a trip to Cusco, Peru, uh, hence the name of the group, Cusco. And I was so drawn to it, so drawn to it, and then I met in person, Michael Holm came to my home from Bavaria, came here, and I told him that I was very drawn to it, and very drawn to the idea of going to visit Cusco, Peru. Mind you not... E.T. style, I wasn't mashing potatoes and making them into little things, but I've been kind of drawn and been wanting to go to Cusco, Peru. Would it be a good experience? For anybody that can get the little cash together to go, it changes your whole perspective. And I'm listening. See, Art, it's, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the, the nature of the two different people that you knew, one, that rowdy, you know, evangelist, and then this side of me that's this way? Yes. I don't know which of those two people you like the most, but anyone who takes the time to take a pilgrimage, who plans it, who follows it exactly to a routine, yes. will uncover and discover spiritual sites of parts of themselves. Machu Picchu does it, and the trips to Ukai, the Ukai Valley, and I have a route that I go through, changes a person. I just left 40 people at the airport, and the things that they say, because I design it around death and rebirth, and I talk about issues, and I have a whole program. Anybody, and I, I mean, it's you know, I recommend it so deeply because you take yourself out of this world, and you put yourself high in the mountains in the Andes, fifteen thousand feet culture, and you hear stories, and yes. you meet people, and you understand that all the stuff that we've been hearing all our lives, most of it's a lie to start with. There's one thing that, and I recommend it, and if ever I'm going, you can come and go with me. I mean, you're I, welcome. I would to love to. With. I would love to. I yeah, really but, uh, would love to. I mean, you're welcome, and I'll see to it, and I'll talk to the bass. And I, I try to go two or three times a year because it gives me the calm, tranquil, inner peace that I need to get out and fight for the rights of people who are leaving this world, to defend the rights, and to give insight to people in my age group who are losing people, and to show them the true joy and the mystical side of this of this whole life and this adventure. Now, think of this, Art. I was doing a television show for UPN called Paranormal Borderline. Oh, Gordon Michael did it as well. Uh, yeah, great show. They're doing a good job. And uh, I was listening. I think my show is May the 7th. May 7th. May 7th at 9 p.m. on UPN Paranormal Borderline. But what's so significant about it is my segment's just Daniel Brinkley. You know, uh, it has to do with me being able to go from this side of the world to the other side and mm -hmm. come back and talk to people on the other side and that I can do that naturally. I live in both worlds and I try to teach ways like in that piece in the light. I teach ways that you yourself can do that and that you can do it faster by being a hospice volunteer than any other way. Right. Guess who the first segment is? Who? Neil Armstrong. No kidding. Neil Armstrong, the, the Mercury, he was with Mercury 7, 20 years an astronaut, one of the straight, most conservative people, you know, guy from the right stuff. That whole shtick. You know what he's going to say? He's going to say that the government's liars. What? That he what? has... What? Are you sure? Wait, wait, oh, stop. listen to me, pal. Oh, yeah, are you sure about this? He's... Listen to me. All right. Well, no, I'm going to stop you because I'm going to tell you something else first. Because uh, you were out of the country. You don't know this happened. Uh-uh. Um... This last Friday evening on NBC's Dateline, 
Guess who was on? Who? Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. Guess what he said? They're liars. He said Roswell was covered up. They lied. They've lied to us about Roswell. He said we've been visited here on Earth. They're covering that up too. They lied. That was Edgar Mitchell. It was a total blowaway Friday this last Friday night when you were out of the country. Well, that's even better because listen to it. Look at who. Neil so you're Armstrong. you're telling me Neil Armstrong's going to come on Paranormal Borderline May seventh, oh, same May show you're on. May seventh at nine o'clock, and he's going to say, "Listen, what? I saw him. I not only know what? that there were there were unidentified flying objects from somewhere outside. I know it. I saw him. The government took pictures of them. It, you know, oh, Edgar Mitchell God. wasn't at Roswell. I, I understand. You're going to say, you're, are you sure of that? I mean, you, you were there when he said this? Yes. You watch it. I think that Paranormal Borderline and the, the behavioral, Scott Katama, oh the producer, he said, listen, Daniel, because I'm really careful. You know the shows that I do, and I don't get myself caught up in controversy. I do. I stay in controversy, but things I know about. I know about death and dying. But when I saw Neil Armstrong is going to say, look, I'm tired of it. I'm so, I saw them on my mission. I saw them around. They mm. took pictures. They've known about it. I was there. Edgar can tell. I know Mr. Mitchell. And he can say anything. Everybody has opinions about what might have been happening. There's a lot of information, and it's been proven that that was that. Well, Neil Armstrong has hinted in the past. I mean, he went to the White House, for heaven's sakes, and said there are things out there you can't imagine, uh, things lying ahead you can't imagine. Now, he's always hinted. Well, but he you're telling it straight up, oh as straightforward as you'll ever hear it on Paranormal Borderline. And I'm really proud, because these are the issues that once we start opening up our consciousness and we realize how controlled that we are, just like what you're talking about, the money. The money has to be able to devaluate the United States. They're going to have blue bills and, uh, let's see, greenbacks, bluebacks, and redbacks. And that's so that our money can stay domestic. You can't transfer your money unless you change it into the different kinds of currency. And, I mean, that was a part of the vision that I saw. But I really think that the biggest problem they're all going to have uh, especially those who try to control us and take our rights, like HMOs. You know, I've got this big thing about HMOs and managed care because I think it's literally the most horrendous thing that's going to happen to our moms and dads, and I fight against it. But they forget this, Art. Boy, we Daniel, I, I'm, be... I'm telling you, if Neil Armstrong says what you say he's going to say, it's going to blow everything wide open. Tell me about it. And that's why I wanted to get it out. And I wanted to be it on, and I don't know if they know I'm telling everybody, but I wanted it to be on the Art Bell Show. This, I wanted it to be that I saw this, I was there. I have a part of what's going to be on the show is about me. But when I saw him yeah. and what he does, I'm really proud to be a part. And I'm really proud to tell your listeners that if you want to see the most ultra-conservative guy... Oh, hell yes. Daniel, I mean, did, did, he doesn't get off on... And, you know, I like Edgar Mitchell, but no edit science. You no, know, I hear you. went into re doing some other kind of stuff. You've easily topped me now. That now, uh, did you see a tape of it, what they were going to show? Did you? I actually... read the, the transcript. You read the transcript? Because before I'll do a show, you know, I have to look at it. You know, I don't... I, I'm only interested in what has to do with the dealing with people and how they die. And I don't do UFOs. Right, stuff. I've, I've got you. I've got but you. But when I sat and I read this, I was staggered. Because, you know, I don't know about all that stuff, but I know Barbara Marciniak, who wrote uh, Bringers of the Dawn, and she's a really wonderful person. I think a lot of her, and I listen to what she says, and she's channeling this stuff from somewhere, but it's so much information. But when a guy who is straight, conservative, you know, conservative, who never went off on one tangent, and because of the age of it, that it is, and because he sees how much the lie, he's going to say it. He's going to say, hey, look, I saw him. The government knows about it. I don't know why they're continuous doing this. because, And he's going to, like, say, because he thinks that once they started covering up that they couldn't stop and they build their own little fiefdoms and they have to self-perpetuate their agencies. And religion, the biggest thing is that religion, if there is a UFO, then what we have been taught in our religious nature becomes almost obsolete. The, the magnitude of the news you're breaking right now is... Gigantic. Absolutely, it is. <laughs> All right. Um, and I mean, I didn't mean to get off on my subject matter, but glad I you believe... did. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Listen, let me uh, read a fact to you. It's a good one. 
Um, Mr. Bell, I'm very excited to hear Daniel Brinkley on your show tonight. Read his first book, thoroughly enjoyed it. Lent it to a friend, also enjoyed it. Got a question about one of the revelations Mr. Brinkley made in the book. I remember reading, but can't seem to find it in the book again. There would be a discovery in Egypt that would cause the world to rethink the origins of man. I recently saw a special on the Discovery Channel that theorized the Sphinx was the product of a civilization that was present prior to the Egyptians under the rule of the pharaohs. In fact, the Sphinx is 10,000 years older than previously thought. Is this, that revelation, come true? Uh, It's the beginning of it. There is absolutely no question, none, that in the next three years, two things will come about. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the information that has been contained in them will be released, which will literally revolutionize Christianity. It will change Christi- the perspective of Christianity a thousand percent. I don't want to get into that because I don't want religious <coughs> wars. I don't mean I don't want to break down it. I don't want to break it, break it down any faster than it's doing it to itself. Yeah. The other thing is they're going to discover, no question about it, archives, translatable, that literally begin to tell the history of this world that is going to completely alter the way we see ourselves. And this is in the next three years. In the midst of war, in the midst of threatenings of war, you know, there's like 30, 35 wars going on. The Chinese, Jap- the Chinese, the Indians, and the Pakistanians are on a nuclear, every one of them is preparing to explode nuclear uh, testing. They all, and the Pakistani-Chinese border, are, they're killing people every day there. So, I mean, this is the world that we're moving into. And what happens if we realize there are extraterrestrials? And what happens once we know that the history as we know it evolved to religious theocratic monarchies all the way to the basis of what we call the, our religious uh, philosophy of the, the evolution of man? What's going to happen? Anarchy. We will have total breakdown. Total breakdown. That's everything. what I just said. Anarchy. It'll be complete anarchy. I am God, con- won't that be exciting? I'm convinced. <laughs> oh, Daniel. Uh, listen, we've got to take a few calls. Um, we've just got to do that. It's ringing off the hook here. So uh, let's. Do you think that that means that people like us are? I I think that means you've blown them away. I'm sure you've blown them away. You've blown me away. Um, I'm going to have to get a partial recording of this show for tomorrow night. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Daniel Brinkley. Where are you calling from, please? Yes, I'm calling from Lexington, Kentucky. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I wanted to ask a question about something he mentioned earlier. Um, I have a friend who has a serious medical condition. It's potentially life-threatening, and he had mentioned some alternative healing uh, perspectives that he had. I wonder if he could elaborate on that a little bit. All right. Do you, do you want to tell us what kind of problem it is? Well, he, he's got a multitude of viruses that the uh, medical community can't do anything about. All right, good. Um, the first thing that I would do is uh, there's the National Institute for Health Office of Alternative Medicine who uh, are, is, are doing research in those kinds of programs. Just You can call your congressman and get the NIH OAM. There is another place that you can look that it's a, uh, it's a magazine by called Alternative Therapies that the editor is Dr. Larry Dossey, who is one of the best. And uh, Well, if my understanding of the kennedy Kassenbaum bill is correct, then uh, that would... Oh, you're going to be put in jail if you do it. Yeah, but, but you just said there was an NIH... Office of Alternative Medicine. What happens to that office? They're trying to close it now with all their heart, mind, and soul. That's one of the things I like to... Why I wanted to be on your show, so that people would call and write their congressman and tell them that they support two things more than they support anything else that the, those fools are doing up there and that's the guarantee to freedom the access to medical treatment act of 1995 right which is the one of i believe without question the most important single piece of legislation that will come in our lifetime the other thing is to be alerted to the fact that house bill 310311 was voted on, and it literally, I'll read to you what it says. What, uh, what is the number again, 303? So House Bill 310311. Mm-hmm. And that what is being debated today, they voted on it last Thursday, if everyone would call their congressman and senator and tell them that they they are totally opposed to this. This is what it says. It is a, It will make it a criminal act for both the physician and his patient to practice alternative medicines not covered by approved medical establishment. That's taking vitamins, Art. They're out of their minds. Well, you know what? 
if we are out of our minds, if we don't call our congressman tomorrow and our senator, because the House passed it unanimously, as long as there is alternative therapeutic practices in place and we have access to them, they can never control our health care, which is what they're after. How you control the people? And if everyone reads the Save by the Light, the chip technology that will be implanted, that technology is being advanced to, to a point where a new deal with the Veterans Administration called TRICARE is issuing medical cards with computer with uh, chips mm-hmm. in it that contain oh, yes. your entire medical history. Oh, yes. and, with, and they're doing this the same way that if in, in Save by the Light, I write it out and said, this is what will happen. If I wrote this book in 92 and 93, it would still be a revolution in the predictions. I wrote this stuff down in 1975 and 76, recorded it on cassettes. I mean, you know, it, I didn't just blow into town yesterday. Mm-hmm. But it is tomorrow. They're going to vote again on Tuesday, and we will lose our rights. So for the gentleman that we're talking to, alternative therapies and making a decision. I'll tell you, if he has a lot of viruses, there is two things that I would do. I would especially look at Qigong. We have light bodies. One of the things that I learned about being dead, quote unquote, which really never happens, you never die, was that we have a com- we're composed of a series of light bodies. We have energy fields, and some people call them auras, mm-hmm. but we have light bodies. So when a person gets a lot of disease or a lot of things that's happening to them, like viral infections, then they are their light bodies, the essence of their ability to break down and assimilate by biochemical reaction the necessary things to fight it off. Also, a lot of people have a lot of neural problems. That means that you have peptide bonds and you have neural transmitters that have insufficient uh, mineral salts and trace minerals to actively uh, cause the body to uh, heal itself. So that's what they're getting ready to do away with. They have to stop it. If there is alternative therapies in place, that means you, you can, you'll always have a place where you can seek your own treatment and they will have to pay for it. They must stop it because it's too threatening and it's too natural. I mean, it, the whole it, there is no longer the art of healing. There is the business of medicine. Do you um, realize, I, I've read the both medical, Medicaid and Medicare bills. I, look, I'm just a layman, Daniel, but it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that will produce an actual bloody violent revolution. No kidding? Yeah, no kidding. They I mean, think, how, how dare they? That's what, you know what, Art, that's what I like about you and your listeners. And that's what I like about <laughs> because we, it's, these are my kind of people. I am in the world, as I look at it, to try to strengthen the of the final days because guess who they're talking about? They're talking about our moms and our dads. They're talking about our aunts and uncles and their brothers and sisters. And for me, because I know what it's like to die. I know what it's like to face death. I know what it's like to see the other side. And I know what it's like to come back. I'm like, so I have brothers and sisters I've never met that's in the same place I am. And since I'm not afraid of it, and, it's, and I do this every day, I'm around people every day, so I am really good and knowledgeable about all the tricks that they use, what they're trying to do, and how they're trying to do it to control us. And once they can control that with with psychological natures of fear-based pattern psychology... All right, hold it right there, Daniel. Uh, was achieved through the basics of uh, medical care, access to medical care, food... A shelter. If they control those things, they control you. Man, what a night. Daniel Brinkley, just back from Peru by hours, is my guest, and he'll be right back. This is the end of side one. From the Kingdom of Nine, you're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. But in the program, call toll free 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618. Time caller, free code 702 727 1222. 702 795. This is the CBC Radio Network. If you haven't uh, called as much as we should have, I'll try and correct some of that this afternoon. So much news from Daniel Brinkley that still has me stopped cold. 
happy. All right, back now to Daniel. Uh, a lot of you say, I'm sure you realize, and I found this out of these way, a lot of the things you're saying will make a lot of people really angry. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that means they'll get off their butts and do something. When you have those deeply held faiths, uh, or even cause them to get a lot of people react with absolute anger. Oh, yeah, those are the ones I like the best. You know, all things that are not so easily put in a box, as it That's says. That's what I like about you. But, oh, Daniel, people will call me sometimes during the week, and they will be just raging at me. I had one probably uh, the devil himself. I'm leading people <laughs> down the path. Anything you like, actually, I do. <laughs> They're the most delightful people. In the Go ahead, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that was it. I mean, I, I, I took a call. Uh, well, I'm 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 the I said I was leading people to the devil and everything else. Well, I don't want that. And then, uh, you know, when people ask me, they say, Daisy, what about people who are skeptical and sometimes even skeptical? What did you say? If I get along with them, great. Because if they think they cross a cynical, skeptical person, then they think they are. They should have met the Daniel Brady and said, art. When you start listening, and I laugh, and I said, well, do you mean to tell me that something that took so long, it's been good to me because I've worked my life. Daniel, I can tell you what they'd say. I can be one of them. They'd say, Daniel, look at those people. You're not telling them about God, so you've got to be from the devil. Misleading these people. Uh, You're costing souls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm a, I'm I'm a, I've had the calls. People. I've had the calls. Well, you, get, you get them to write me letters and tell them to, uh, <laughs> you know, tell <laughs> me. Letters. Oh, I'm really? Post Office Box 1919, Aiken, If someone wants to write me, you write me good or bad. If you want, a, if you want the book, you give me a little uh, mail order, a uh, cashier's check, and I'll put you on my mail and start putting out my newsletter when I quit this tour. And I'm not afraid of any of that. It's for the government and religions and institutions who have held us, without us allowing us to tune the first that we die, that we're powerful spiritual beings. And we're not able to that, but it shakes them. They can't become gods, and they can't, when you have knowledge here in six months of life, to extend life 19 days, and if you have a death, and you read them like I read them, doctors are getting a 20% increase in the amount of fees that they can charge. They're also listing the band on if a doctor has a vested interest in a laboratory, yes, I know. then he can go ahead and in your access to medical freedom because you paid more money and they're charging you a higher uh, Eastern Rockies, Daniel Brinkley. Hello, where are you, please? Hello there. You're to me, spiritual adultery. Uh, Daniel, you're to me. There's an 8,000 people are volunteered to do hospice work. Well, wait, let, hospice let's see if he's... Let's see. Sorry. No, he bailed out. That's what they do. They call up usually and say you're the Antichrist and hang up. Well, then let's do this. Everyone has that right. We are powerful and mighty spiritual beings. You have a right to believe what you want to believe. I believe there's two ways to know for sure. There's the Danian long course and the Danian short course. <laughs> the Danian long course is to listen to Danian and Art Bell with all our hearts and all our souls as just everyday guys with experiences and the ability to open our eyes and look and try to understand it. Then there's the short course, which is to take a screwdriver and stick in a 220 outlet, call us up when you call us back when you get up. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Danian Brinkley. Hello, this is Sharon from Santa Barbara. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Danian. I've just finished reading your two books, and I really enjoyed your information. Thank I'm, you, ma'am. I'm very moved by your personal mission to create healing centers, and you've only just barely touched on that tonight. Where are you with that development? I have one completely built, and I, you know, I had till 92 in the books. You know, I had to till 92. Yes. I have one completely built. I'm still working on the chamber, but I can't figure out what it does. And, you know, I, I, even when it came from the other side here, I still want to make sure it's just right. Now, I've taken uh, people through it that are terminal, and I usually take them in the primary caregiver. I'm waiting for the for the research paradigm protocol before I really jump out and start running so and raving. In other words, it. it's going to be a while before you can put out a sign saying over 2 billion served. Well, I, I <laughs> believe that it will move so fast once that people, if they can't stop alternative therapies, and I believe that this these centers are the place in the point where the spiritual side has brought to bear that if they try to stop us from alternative therapies, then these centers will take on any other paradigm for bereavement, trauma recovery, grief recovery, and stress management for health care for professionals and caregiver for the caregiver. All right, well, they can say what they want of you, Daniel, but I'll tell you this. Anybody who's done as much hospice work as you have done, sat by the dying, that many of them, 
um, I, I, I would be comfortable um, with your motivations before I would be many others. Believe me, Daniel. And I do it, but you see, Art, it's what I do best. And I have recruited more hospice volunteers than anybody ever. And all of, I mean, there's more people who go and do hospice work every day because of my workshops and seminars, and I get letters from all over the world. They call them Daniel Nights. <laughs> because I teach people, I, I, I don't try to compete with hospice. I say, look, go do hospice programs, and then I'll teach you, teach you how to get around it. Because that where we are, yeah, us baby boomers, I just came off the mountain and have We all have in my books are where I have seen beings of light come to take someone. I have seen people saying, Mother's here, and I look at the end of the bed, and I still look like Mother to me, but I can see the difference in the light. And it came away. If a person wants to be able to know there's a life after death and find the security in the, then hospice work is it. I think the greatest sin is all this crap that doctors do in religions and institutions to keep us fear based keeps us from closure. I see events. In well, that, that, that's what I meant when I said uh, they would say to you, you should be putting the fear of God into them. I don't see them in those hospitals and nursing homes. And you know what gets me, Art? That wherever, my religion is hospice. And where two or more gather in the name of spirit, so shall spirit be there. And I know that that's there because I've seen it. There is only one place in the history and the nature of the human experience where all three systems, mental, physical, and spiritual, spiritual, uh, you know, in order for electricity or current to work in any form, you got to have a proton, electron, and a neutron. Yes. You are the proton. You are the electron. The person leaving this world is the neutron, and the spiritual world is the proton. And when you understand that what's being created between you, that person, and the spiritual world in the breathing techniques that I teach, you are creating the sign of infinity. And where the worlds meet, where the spiritual world the physical world and the mental world meet is at that point. At that point, we have the capability of not only creating a means by which the spiritual world can move through that person leaving this world into you and out into, a fir- out into this world to change it. It allows families to have closure. Once closure is in place, a lot of raping and murder and alcoholism and a lot of stuff stops because they could, they have closure, whereas the system in place now will not allow it. And that's the war I fight, because I don't read it in the magazine. I don't form opinions about it because I'm sitting at home hiding. I'm in these nursing homes. I'm in these hospitals. I travel all over this country. I talk to people who are volunteers. I write books about it because it, and we must do it as champions. We must seize control of our lives because it's our moms and our dads. And that's my fight, and that's what I'm after. And I know that there are people out there group as me facing the same thing. And if I wasn't out there and I wasn't giving it everything I got, then I think that... If I look at it, if there is somebody out there that has been through what I've been through, and they weren't out here helping me, then who in the hang does that person think they are? Yeah. I'm out here with my brothers and my sisters. I'm out here with Art Bell because he's doing everything in his power to alert the American people and the world who listens to him to the options that are their choices. I never hear about you trying to put some kind of dogma on someone, no. but you make the, the information available, and I'm glad I get to play with you so often, Art. <laughs> All right, thanks, Daniel. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Daniel Brinkley. Good evening. This is Fritz from Phoenix. Damien very well said about the Neil Armstrong uh, uh, situation here, and I put two and two together. Edgar Mitchell probably found out that Neil Armstrong will make a statement on borderline, so he jumped the gun and went on dateline. That could be. Uh, I agree because Neil, when you know, uh, Edgar's been through, Edgar's wonderful. He's been through a lot of changes because of the profound spiritual effect it's had on him. Neil is very tight, very conservative, and he is just a guy that hit the age in his life where he's had enough of it. Well, you, uh, Fritz, you know and I know uh, what uh, Daniel said tonight is yes. blockbuster news. That's not blockbuster. It's a major event. If this is true, the whole if the world doesn't react. The world is serves what's going to come if they don't react, what Neil Armstrong's going to say. And the next astronaut, I'm sure it's going to be Cooper. He will come out of the woodworks, too. All the right. domino's going to fall now. Yeah, this would do it. I, I agree with Fritz. It's May 7th on Paranormal Borderline at 9 p.m. on UPN. It's, it's not... You know, it's not going to be an underground newspaper that you got to meet someone in a corner bar to get you a copy. It's going to go national, and it's that night. And 
I'm proud to be on the show myself. It's I suddenly, think. Daniel, like a snowball coming down the hill, gathering uh, more and more weight and, and velocity as she comes down. It's, it's really coming down the hill the, right now. The same way with this issue, the same way with near-death experiences, the same way with alternative therapies. Here's what's going to happen. They will either let go and admit that they are wrong and admit that they've been hiding and they come up with a really good reason and, you know, or, or just a crummy reason. I don't care. Let's get on to the truth. Let's get on to the issues. Let's get on to broadening our minds as the, the spiritual event moves toward us. And who cares? Or they are going to try to control it more, lie to us more, and deceive us more. And it's just which way they go determines how we go. All right, Daniel. First time caller line. You're on the air with Daniel Brinkley. Hello. Hello, how are you, Art? Uh, just fine. Where are you? I'm calling from uh, above the above the hills in Jacksonville. All right. On the mighty KOPE. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my call, and thank you for bringing this to the air. You bet. And uh, my question is, uh, first of all, we didn't get on with uh, uh, any visions that he might have had, any prophecy, anything that's going to come about, and I wanted to cover that if we get time. And second of all, uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Brinkley, uh, I'm involved right now in a group in our area. In we live up here in the forest, and we're very concerned about the direction that this has taken. And I've lived here in the area for many years, and have seen uh, the forest practically disappear. And it yeah, brings with the new sessions act that was just recently passed. Uh, you know, Mr. Clinton gave sold the land for a dollar to, to destroy the entire virgin timber. That's right, and we're seeing that because we live here in it, and uh, I've lived here in it for a long time, and I'm very concerned in it, and it wrenches me deep in my heart. To well, see I can this tell happening. you something. That is just another part about what is happening to everybody. James Redfield, I've been, because see, I get involved in it. I don't hide from these things. There is a group that is uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm working with James Redfield and Stephen Seagal, the, uh, the action heroes. Oh, yes. The person, uh, uh, Stephen Seagal is a very good friend of mine, and so is James Redfield, the author of The Celestine Prophecy. And we have been looking at the uh, the salvage rider bill, and it's coming up again. And I mean, I, I have a copy of the information. It's called the First or Bradley Bills. And if anybody would like to call to be able to join this business, it's 202-544-9219. What always amazes me is this. When everyone knows that how we breathe are these trees. Now, what happens? You're going to have a lot of beautiful houses, but no air to breathe. And it's another part of the government being able, and I'm not really anti-government, everybody, because there's some good, hard-working, wonderful, decent people, but they're caught up in the system trap. they got to make those decisions because they have to feed their families. But we have to look at what's happening in our environment, in our health care, in uh, the deception of the government, in the secret spies, in the big brother system, in the control of the money. And it comes down to why are they doing this? Daniel, we're about out of time. Uh, his other question was with regard to prophecy, and I don't see how he could have listened to tonight's program. There's been, been 30 or 40 really good ones. And not heard a lot of prophecy, close in uh, at that, and a lot of shockers. Daniel, well, uh, tell him to write me, and I will send him copies. Tell people to send me two checks, and I'll send them. I'll get at Peace in the Light and Saved by the Light. I'll autograph them, and I'll send them to him if it takes me the rest of my life. All right, it's Post Office Box. It's Daniel Brinkley, Post Office Box 1919, Aiken, A-I-K-E-N, South Carolina, zip code 29802, right? 1350 for each book, and please write on the envelope, Art Bell is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, uh, as always, it's a great pleasure. I'm glad we caught you at such a interesting moment in your explain, existence. Before you go, Art, please explain that to me. Um, what is I the sense, difference? I don't know. I sense a changed Daniel, uh, an affected Daniel, uh, by being in Peru, I'm sure. Come go with me, Art. Yeah, I, I, I will walk you through a near-death experience. I'll take you to the Crystal Cities. And I, was, I have my program that I've designed, Enlightened Shamans, 
and I take them to a, uh, people to a monastery that has the most most spiritual energy that there is, it relaxes you, gives you new focus and direction, and I'm good for another six months, and then I'll burn out and I'll take myself right back down there. Well, I'm past time, so it well, sounds. You get, you're welcome to come with me. Sounds I'll, good. Call Visions Travel in Los Angeles and tell them I sent you. All right, Daniel, for, thank you. Hey. Thank you, Art. I love you very much. And the listening audience, please tell everybody about Art Bell. <laughs> Good night, Art. Daniel Brinkley. That's it, everybody. We're out of time. I'm going to them. Get the of tonight's show, and this really ought to be one that you should want to archive. Please call 1-800-917-4278. Let me give that again. 1-800-917-4278. 4278. Uh, to get my book, The Art of Talk, it's 1-800-864-7991. That's 1-800-864-7991. Till next week from the high desert, good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.